and it's my honor to be here with you. Esther, chapter 2, verse 7. We're going to be speaking about how to be ignited to save a nation. How God took an ordinary woman and made her a savior of a nation. That's a, it's, it's, it's so unlikely. But when God ignites what he puts upon you, all things are possible. In the Old Testament, you had to go to a prophet to know the word of the Lord. Those were the healers. Those were the deliverers. Those were the ones with the miracle signs and wonders, call down fire, step in water, it divide. And the prophets were the powerful one. Now, every believer carries the God of Moses in their belly. Every believer can manifest the glory of God because Christ in us is hope for a world that is hopeless. You are more valuable than gold right now because a lot of people have lots of gold and they still are depressed. Kids come from rich homes and they're cutting themselves because when they cut themselves, they feel and they are numb on the inside. So they want to cut themselves to make sure I'm alive. Blood can come because they feel numb. Social media has numbed them, has controlled their mind, controlled their thinking. People are don't know what to do. In, in, in my country, they have legalized euthanasia. So if you want to kill yourself, it can be legal. When a government has no hope, you have to give alternatives. More liquor, more beer, more opiates, more drugs, more of things that can satisfy you for a moment and then you wake up in a deeper depression. One lady who came to us and she was so deeply depressed and she was from India and she was known to praying to many gods. She says, when I looked through the window, it was so dark and her mother lived with her and her husband and she says, Mom, it's so dark. And she says, no, the sun is shining. You know, depression is a very lonely thing because nobody can go into your space with you. You are experiencing the darkness. And no matter how they love you, it doesn't work. No matter what they give you to take as medication, it doesn't work because light has an owner. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And he has turned around and made you now the light of the world. And so you're very valuable. You are very valuable. So in Esther chapter 2 verse 7, it says, Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This girl, who was also known as Esther, was lovely in form and features, and Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter. He, has adopt, he adopted her when her father and mother died. We're studying some great heroes of the Bible because there's a lot to learn from them. There, there are things that they had to do. God not only saw them, but he trusted them. And like I said last night, it's one thing for you to trust God, but it's another thing for God to trust you. And so we look at the lives of these great people and think, what is it? Jephthah, uh, whose mother was a prostitute. Hannah, who was barren. Gideon, who was totally frustrated with God. And yet he called them and empowered them and transformed them that they became heroes. 
Something is in that. Something is in that. Abram was a pagan. His wife was barren. One, he was 70, she was 60. Impossible to have children. And he chose it. And he says, leave your father, country and culture and money and leave everything and come to a place I will show you. You qualify, Abram. I trust you even though you're worshiping other gods, but I, Elohim, have come to you now to make myself known. I am the God Almighty. And something triggered in Abram to know this is not normal. This is not the idols I'm used to. I've been praying to so many idols, and my wife is still barren. Something triggered to make him want to say yes. And God found a man. And people of God, sometimes people around you are struggling. But one experience with God and the power and the glory he can bestow upon them. They can be transformed and become glory manifesting on earth. He says, Saul, you know, I, I watched you. You persecuted the Christians, you throw them in jail, and now you're hot on your way to go towards them to shut down my church because they're going to build it. Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, why, Lord? Oh, you called me Lord. Immediately he knew he was in the presence of a greater power, a higher name. Something make him say, Lord, how am I persecuting you? And Jesus spoke to him. He never, maybe never go to the sermons. He heard about this Jesus, but he just knew I want to destroy Christianity. I want to destroy anything. And then he bowed down and God made him lie down. It's holy ground now. And I've not come to play with you. I've come to either kill you or empower you. And Paul says, speak, Lord. Thy servant is listening. Just to make sure you don't think you're dreaming, you'll be blinded for three days. And you will know that you are in front of the Jesus you tried to stop. I'm the resurrection and the life. I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the Lion of the tribe of Judah. There are some names that are new in the New Testament. They never knew about the resurrection and the life. They never knew about the Lamb of God. Revelation has not stopped people. Sometimes we think, well, uh, well, okay, the 66 book, revelation continues because God is too great for 66 books. God is too great for only the Bible. So he reveals himself in different generations, even by different name, and rebrand himself with a name that has a different purpose for our generation. He was not called Jesus in the Old Testament. And yet he always was Jesus. He was the savior that empowered Moses to save two million people. But he didn't give them the name Jesus. He said, Moses says, Pharaoh wants to know who are you? What, what name do I tell the people? Just tell them I am. Because I'm too big for Pharaoh to understand. So just say, I am that I am. That's all. I am that, that's all. Because any name that I give him, he wouldn't believe anyway. But then years later, he came in the flesh of a woman and said, call me Jesus. Not I am now, but he was the same I am. But now my name is Jesus, for I will save the world. I am the Messiah. He is God. His eyes is like flame of fire. 
And in the heavens, they are singing to the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. And in heaven, they're calling him Alpha and Omega, no beginning, no end. He is God. He is the creator from the beginning. But he's revealing himself through names after names after names so that we can get it. The children of Israel poisoned water. And they cried out to Moses and complained. And Moses went to God. And he said to Moses, Moses, I am the God that heals. Jehovah Rapha. And not, that healing was not just for water. It's, it's, most of the time when we go for healing, we go because we're sick. But that healing means anything that needs to be healed. It could be a relationship. It could be water. It could be food. It could be anything. I am the Lord that heals anything that has been demonized. Anything that is damaged, I can heal. I can heal your business. You hear what I'm saying? This is not just because I'm blind and I can see now. No, I can heal water. I can heal poison. I can heal poisonous water and make you drink it and get stronger and stronger. I am the Lord, Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. I can really heal the relationship between you and your parents. I can heal the relationships in your life. I can heal a nation. Paul went and healed a nation. Ephesus transformed that nation and they threw out all the occult and all the wickedness and they became a Christian nation. I am the Lord that heals. I can heal Sweden. Yeah. And so we're studying them. In Malachi 3, 6, the Bible says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you descendants of Jacob are not destroyed. Understand my dynamics. I do not change. What I did for Moses, I am still the same God today. What I did for Abram, I'm still the same God today. Because I reveal to you and rebrand my name, it doesn't mean I'm not the same today, yesterday, and forever. He is too great. There's no one name that can describe him. So he reveals himself according to the season and the time. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Revelation 1, 8 says he is the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. Says the Lord, the God who is, the God who was, the God who is to come, the Lord God Almighty. And so we're going to see what God did. And we're going to learn what he can do through us. Esther. Esther. In Esther chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. What we can learn from them, number one, Esther did not have a perfect family. She was an orphan. Her parents died. Whatever you are now in your business, in your family, etc., 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 God does not wait for perfect people to do a glorious work. It's, it seems he does the opposite. Everyone he chooses had a dysfunction. Turned to the person beside and said, that means you qualify. Praise the Lord. Hello. Hello. You're not perfect. Yeah. Okay, then. He does not wait. Because if you are not perfect now, he knows your heart. And he's waiting to tell you, I can trust you. I can empower you. And you can do great and mighty things and give me glory through you. Amen. And so the second thing we learn from Esther in Esther chapter 2 verse 3. 
The Jews were in a time of captivity by the king of Persia and he divorced his wife Vashti, ordered the soldiers to find and capture young beautiful girls and put them by force in a special place in the palace. Esther 2 verse 3. It says, let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful girls into the harem at the city of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let the beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the girl who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. And this advice appealed to the king. He followed it. Esther, by force, was taken from the safety of Mordecai and thrown in a royal prostitution where the king had the right to call anyone at any time. And Mordecai is at the gate every day looking at Esther. Have you been defiled? What is happening to you? And he's crying and praying at the gate. Want to see her? It was not an easy, nice situation. But Esther survived. And if you're not in an easy, nice situation now, I tell you, you shall survive. We have to understand do not allow a difficult childhood or a difficulty in your home or a difficulty in your work to make you bitter and self-destruct. This too shall pass. Hold it together. Cry out to God. And God will bring deliverance in the right time. And then he's going to make the enemy pay you back. Because he's taking note. He's taking note for how long you have been in slavery. How long you have been beaten. How long all of this. And he says, I, when I come, it is payback time in the name of Jesus. And I will make sure the devil know you touch the wrong man. You touch the wrong woman. That was my servant that you touched and I will make her crush your head I will crush the spirit that is in you and then you can have mercy and be saved it was a hard time it's a hard time it's interesting that Esther won the favor of the eunuch you see, God is setting you up for more. I, I don't know how she preserved herself, but the eunuch loved her more than all the other women. Because this Kail glory that we're learning about will make people love you even when they don't like you. You are connected to a purpose. If your purpose needs money, God will give you the right sponsor. If your purpose need coaching, God will give you the right coaching. Whatever your purpose is, he will put people in your place. I mean, David, Saul will love you and give you a job. You will be in the palace and I will make him need you. And when the demon comes upon you, he will call David, come and play your harp. And when David plays harp, the demons were subdued. God will make the enemy need you. Oh, lift up your hands. Who am I talking to? This is serious stuff. I'll tell you, God is the greatest manipulator. He set up Satan good. Don't kill me by an electric chair. Don't kill me with a sword. Don't kill me with a bow and arrow. No. Let me suffer. As a matter of fact, Beat me before I go, I go on the cross. I want you to nail my hands. I want you to nail my feet. 
And then, and then you're going to be so wicked. You're going to take a crown of thorn and you're going to shove it onto my head. I want it. I will allow it. At any time I could call even one angel, you know, to come and get me. No, but I want you to finish the lust in your heart, the wickedness in your heart, the occult in your heart, the, the danger in your heart. Because once you're finished, I'm going to deal with every kind of sin and every kind of sickness and every kind of power. And every name that can be named is going to be falling to the name Jesus. He set up the devil. He set him up. And then he says, stop me, wicked. It's not enough for how you're torturing me. Okay, stop me in my side. And the blood and water flowed. People of God now, the Lamb of God on the throne has living water flowing from the throne. That's just to show you what's available for you. Blood and water is always available for you. Blood to cover all your sins and water to heal your body because everything that living water touch is healed. Oh, Rashi Kabakasa, lift up your hands, people of God. When I'm praying healing for people, sometimes I hook them up to a blood transfusion because the Bible says life is in the blood of Jesus Christ. Or sometimes I hook them up to the living water because that living water will restore brain cells. The science used to say, say that brain cells cannot be restored. Now science is saying, yes, brain cells can be restored because living water God can heal anything in any way hallelujah God manipulates all things work together for good for those who love you everything that you have gone through is because it's now has given you access to a certain amount of payback you understand? If you didn't have anything to pay back, you wouldn't have anything to get in the future. But if the enemy attack you, there's going to be a payback time. If the enemy torture you, it's going to be a payback time. The enemy drive you in the grave, payback time. Try to destroy you, payback time. God is taking notes. He says, Moses, let me calculate first how many years your slavery do you know where that money came from? Your great, great, great grandfather, Joseph, saved Egypt. The king was desperate. God gave Joseph creative power as we heard Pastor Lincoln says. He moved in the spirit realm and got visions and dream and solution and creativity that all the powerful occult people, the powerful people around the king could not bring the solution. Why? Because God has treasures of darkness that only you are going to get the solution. He wants to be famous through you. So that the king knew that if you want answers, go to the God of Joseph. And Joseph says, king, this is how it's going to happen. And Joseph created a new system for economics. It used to be the barter system. Joseph created a whole new system. He made all the nations around that were starving. He says, okay, we will give you food because God already told Joseph, Stirred, store up seven years of corn. Store up seven years of, of wheat. So only, only Egypt had food. Not because of the king, because the man of God. They got the business strategy, the, the trade strategy, I mean, the selling strategy, the, the MOOC selling food for land. They acquired their kingdom not by fighting, but they acquired their kingdom by trade for food. Only Joseph had the answer. Only Joseph could see beyond the flesh, could hear beyond the ear. And God gave him creative the, the king said, this is a genius. A man of wisdom, they call it. He was a genius. Never went to school. He was a slave. And God gave him 
visions and revelation that's beyond the natural what we heard tonight don't just look to the natural lift and shift into another realm where you can call those things that aren't as though they were that's where Joseph lived and now years later 200 years or more later, the same country that Dave, Joseph saved is now enslaving his people, beating the old people. The devil is wicked. God says, I come down to see if what I heard is true. I have heard of the misery. I've seen their tears and I have come down and you're going to leave here, but you're not going to leave Egypt empty handed in the name of Jesus. Go to them and say, go. God, my God has told me to tell you give me silver give me gold and take off the clothes from yourself and your children and give it to me and I will give you my slave clothes in return would you believe they said yes to everything people of God in this season know your clues and cues this is the season where you will go to kings, you will go to people that have what you want, and they will say yes. Quite frankly, I thought, I, I, would, I don't know how I would do that. Go to the, the, the missus and the master that owns me and say, God told me to tell you to give me gold. God told you, yes, that's what God said. Everyone said yes. One day a slave and the next day so much gold that they even got ridiculous and make a golden calf. And begin to worship it and God could have killed them. What is wrong with these people? But in one day people, and we're here now in this season, because I tell you things are happening that is not normal anymore. Do not be afraid to ask. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He can direct it in any way that you can. Do not be afraid to ask. And so when we look at it, do not allow difficult things, but you do not be afraid to ask. Number three, what we're learning from Esther here, be patient in times of trouble because it is a transaction seed for what the enemy meant for evil, God will turn around for good. You're going to take Joseph. You're going to try to kill him. You're going to put him in a pit. You're going to put him in a prison. And Joseph is going to be the one that will save you. So be patient in times of trouble. Just say, God, I know that this is a journey this is not my destination lift up your hands say this is just a journey this is not my destination I will go through the fire I will go through the flood I will go through with all of this and God is gonna make sure that it will lead me to the path of my blessing oh let's clap unto the Lord the blessing Be patient. Be patient and pray. Number four, great favor and authority from God is purpose driven. So people of God, we're talking about God using you greatly. God using me greatly. It's purpose driven. Glory is connected to purpose. Sometimes what we're praying for, we don't get it because you haven't told God what the purpose is. God is a business God. If you want wealth, you have to say to him, you have to make a contract. I was in, my, in, in Indonesia one, and, uh, and someone wanted to sell their house, their apartment complex, where it was about $10 million or, and how much. And she said, can you pray for me that we will get it sold? It cannot be sold. I said, have you made a transaction with God yet? No. Have you made a proposal with God? No. So you want him to give you $10 million, and you haven't told him what he gets out of it? I mean, yeah, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, if you want 10 million, did you tell him how much percentage, what is the fee? What is the percentage you will give him back? 10%, 10%, you're not serious yet. 10% 
of $10 million? You want $10 million and you want to give him a million? You're not serious. If you want that amount of money, I, I will you, I will raise the fee. I will say at least 20% because you have to give tithe plus because this is a miracle you're asking for. Understand the level of what you're asking for and use that as, an, as, a, as a seed to know what you're willing to give him back. He is businesslike. He is businesslike. His demands can be so great. And so in Esther chapter 2, the king Verse 17, Esther chapter 2, verse 17. It says, the king was attracted to Esther more than any other women. She won his favor and approval more than any other of the virgins. She went there as a virgin. She was forced. It was not easy. And so the king loved her more than any other. Why? Because the eunuch taught her how not just to win a beauty contest, but to win the heart of the king. You need to know how to win the heart of the king. You need to know how you distinguish yourself from all the other Christians. There's something about you. Why? Because I've won the heart of my king. He knows he can trust me. I've won his heart. And God is looking for somebody. You will win the heart of a king. If you're willing to die for your son to yourself, you will win the heart of the king. Because he knows that when it comes to payback time, you will be ready. This is not about a beauty contest. This was about a nation. How big is your ask? And how big is what God requires of you? Because glory is connected to purpose. Reality is the glory that was upon David. If you're not going to be a king and ready to go and face a Goliath, you don't need that level of glory. The level of glory you need is to even pray one night without sleeping. Try that. Their level of glory has to do with the calling. How much are you ready to die to self? How much are you willing to sacrifice for God? You think he's not valuable? You think it's cheap? Salvation is free, but it's not cheap. He died. He suffered. He was beaten. He was stabbed. It's not cheap. But he has made it free. Glory is connected to purpose. And so Haman, the king of the, the, the king of the king's chief of staff, hated the Jews and he enticed the king to destroy them. Esther chapter 3, verse 13. He he decided, I just hate these people. Why do you hate them? I don't know, but I, I think we need to annihilate them. I mean, they shouldn't be alive, and that is happening again today. Esther 3.13, Haman got the king to, to make an edict. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, annihilate, annihilate the Jews. Kill them off, wipe them from the earth. Young and old, women and little children, kill them off. And they had a date on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Agar, Plunder their goods. And the king put his signet ring on it. Notice the strategy. Every, they send out couriers in every provinces, etc., etc. A group of us got together and decided we have to pray for Canada. And so we're mobilizing different networks in every province. And in every territory. And for the first time in September, four weeks, we're going to teach the biblical worldview. 
the foundations of Christianity. The church has lost what we believe. Do we believe in the Bible anymore? Because we don't carry it, we have it on ourselves. But do we believe in the Bible? What does God say about marriage and the family? Is the Bible relevant? Who is the creator? Who, who is, like mankind right now, feel that they created the world. Because they have no, they don't think there's any higher power at all. We own the world. We can do whatever we want. Yeah, God is going to show you. Every knee shall bow. And when God make a vow and make a declaration, it is already. And for four Sundays, the churches, many churches, hundreds of churches right now have already said yes. This Before I came here, I spoke to one network that has 10,000 people and another network that has 8,000 people. In one hour in my room, 18,000 people says, count me in. We're going to preach the same four sermons in the month of September and one week in in October and so we will bring back the Bible and God's plan for the church into Canada and then we're gonna take back some things that have been stolen from us and we're gonna move as one church and the supremacy of God will again rise in Canada because the church of Jesus Christ He's going to fight for the nation that was owned by him before. And the glory of God is coming because for the unity that we are experiencing, it must be God. God is ready to save the world. If you're alive now, it's because he needs you. That's why you need to know how to activate the hope and glory. Because it's amazing that I am doing the calling. And there's not one great leader. One leader has 100,000 in his, in his network. Another leader today told me 10,000 and 8,000. But I'll go to the other person with the 8,000 and just pull us together. I mean, it's a God thing. Why? Because the hour, the urgency, the fierce urgency of now people of God it is urgent what is happening you've got to save the children the children are being destroyed they're being confused we don't know who we are anymore it used to be normal for you to be a boy or a girl it's not anymore if these children are not saved there will be no tomorrow church the fierce urgency of now the fierce urgency of now. It's not enough to just play church as usual. A man called Martin Luther King says, it's time for slavery to be abolished. It shouldn't be right that people are being used as mules and killed and cut off their hands if they make a mistake cut off and put them in chains and put them in a in a in a ship in a ship and sell them like you're selling a dog it's not right everybody is made in the image of god and there is a destiny in every white man in every black man in every indian man in every chinese man we're all made in the glory of god the fierce urgency of now i talk about it in the book the fierce urgency of now. It was the time and God raised him up and all of a sudden things start to happen and slavery was abolished because somebody said, now is the time. Enough is enough. We have got to make change. People of God, now is the time. The church is the light and the salt of the world. The church is the power of God in our church. The church is the the healer the church is the deliverer the church is the way maker it's now now there are movements that are taking over very violent very aggressive you bow to them or I take away your money you bow to them or I shoot you 
You bow to them, people of God. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in our world. We will not move back. We, the spirit of David, is upon us. We have the power. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of Jesus Christ. The fierce urgency of now. My God, we were having lunch today, and I thought it was only our, con our country, and I heard what they're teaching the little children. They wrote a manifesto, and they're following it out to the T, and it's working. One nation, two nations, three nations, it is working in education system, in the banking system, in the health system. What they created on paper is now working in the natural. But, but the church is still here. The last time I said, come on church. The church is still here. The church is alive. We have the power of Christ in us. Christ in you. The hope of glory. You shall be his witnesses. The church, he has given you a promise. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against you. And you, if you are the church people, he has taken a vow to protect you. Come on, lift up your hand. Oh, harabashata mahalam. Meke oh shadabi. Ekariyara labosoto. Jesus, 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 Jesus. He will make you fearless. He will make you powerful. You're going to speak. You're going to say, let there be and there will be. You see that Pharaoh spirit? Uh-huh. God says, I will harden his heart. Because you're going to show me, you're going to show my glory, Moses. He needs to bow. You understand? He will give back every, every cent or, or dollars or whatever, whatever. Whatever currency you want, just tell God which currency you work in. I ask, I, ask, I ask Caroline, what currency? I'd have to wire the money here or what? You know, whatever. It's all there waiting to be transferred to you. Exodus 4, verse 1. When Mordecai heard the edict that had gone through, when he learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth and ashes, he went out to the city wailing loudly and bitterly. Esther heard that Mordecai is at the gate crying. He couldn't enter the palace yard because he had on ashes and sackcloth. And Esther went and I'd say, go ask him what's wrong. Does he want money? What does he want? What does he want? And Mordecai said, tell her that all the Jews will be wiped out. Tell her that I will be killed. Tell her that the edict is signed by the king. Every Jew, you can walk up and just kill them and we will pay you. And so when Esther heard this, she said, Mordecai, I can't. You know, I'm a Jew. The king didn't know that I, I hid my true identity. And so he will, he will kill me. I, I can't, Mordecai. Uncle Mordecai, please don't ask me to do that. I cannot. I'm afraid. And in Esther 4 verse 12, when Esther's word were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Exodus 4 12. He said, really? Do not think that because you're in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will ex be, be saved. Really? And verse 14, he says, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. Think about it, Esther. And who knows whether you 
have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. People of God, if you're alive, you're here for such a time as this. God needs you now. God needs you now. And Esther, she made a decision. All right then, if I perish, I perish. But please fast for me. And I will fast with my handmaidens. What did Esther do? She died to herself. When you die to yourself, you become a living sacrifice. Well, I used to pray, oh God, make me a living sacrifice to you. Well, I'm a living sacrifice just because I worship. <laughs> I'm a living sacrifice. Really? It's amazing. God dealt with Esther. You know, I, I noticed, let's look at Exodus 4.21. Because we have to understand how this Kyle glory is so powerful and how the way God gets glory is through you, his people. That seems to be the only way. Nature doesn't change people's heart. You know, the biggest hurricane come, we pray and it stops, you know, change. It seems like it's only through people. So in Exodus 4.21, God had already touched Moses and made him like God before Pharaoh. And the Lord said to Moses, Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do all the wonders before Pharaoh, which I put in your hand to do. In other words, show off my glory. For that's the only way that Pharaoh will bow and set my people free. I want you to speak to water and say, turn to blood and it will turn. I want you to call frogs. I want you to do what the satanic priests can do. And they're going to compete with you. And there's going to be a certain time when, I, when the, the, the competition come. And you're going to do something. And they're going to go to Pharaoh and say, I can't do what Moses did. His God is greater than us. People of God, it's you. It's you. It's ordinary people like you and me. That God is going to use. And Moses proved. And God says show it off. Don't hide my miracle in your belly anymore. Don't walk around with my power. And don't use it. Show it off. Dare to heal the sick. Dare to speak to demons. Dare to speak into circumstances. So that it can be changed. Because you say so. He said it this way. You will receive power and you will be my witnesses. In other words, what I am is who you will be. Please don't let my name die out after I go home. Please don't let, don't let them forget me. They're going to threaten you, but you stand boldly because I will be with you and you will build my church and you will launch Christianity as a movement that will be the greatest movement on earth. And now it is because 12 men dared and then 120 in the upper room and it spread like fire. You are a glory spreader. Everywhere you go, you're going to talk about the glory of Christ. You're going you're gonna to spread the glory of God everywhere you go. You're not going to hide him anymore. You're not going to be ashamed of him anymore. You are going to speak, I was blind and now I see. And Jesus did it to me and I can do it to you. Oh, lift up your hands, people. The fierce urgency of now... Kail glory. Let's look at Luke 21, 27, please. Luke 21, 27. This was a verse that changed my mind. It, 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 I woke up to it. Talk about awakening. It says at that time, Jesus is talking about times and seasons, of course, when the world looked like it's going to be ending and all that. So he says at that time, you will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. 
And God says, read it again and again. And the word power and great, look it up in the Old Testament. And when I looked it up, I discovered a word that I never knew, kail. I'm going to put up a PowerPoint now. You can put up that PowerPoint. And let's, let's see what they the put up the PowerPoint. Let's see what this PowerPoint shows about the word. It's up there already. Okay. Kail. Strong's Concordance. You can write it down so you know that this is the concordance. Because we studied the Hebrew. We studied the Greek. We studied the concordance. You need to know this is not wishy-washy. It, it is so powerful and complex. It, it is mentioned 240 times plus. It means God-fearing. It means worshiper. It means moral. It, it, is, it is holistic. It, it is excellent. It's efficient. It's wise. It's strong. It means a host of people. It means valiant, valor, trained, noble, virtuous. The, the Proverbs 31, the virtuous woman, worthy, army, mighty, that army, Gideon's army, David army's troop, company, active, able, honor, ability, honor, honorable, ability, preference, wisdom, favor, full. And I love the fact that words like wisdom and excellence and honor and nobility is in that one one word and then substance in other words you're weighty and you're an influencer you're powerful you're great and then he says mighty warrior I thought wow mighty and warrior those are Kail Kail he said to Gideon Gideon you're a mighty warrior now Get out of the bed of affliction and frustration I make you mighty and a warrior Gideon says, I can't. He says, go in the strength. Kail is strength. It is so holistic, that one word. And then I realized that Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. You're a mighty warrior. Jephthah was a mighty warrior. If you look at the next slide, you know, they put it in their adjectives. And this is usually good because it, 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 it brings relevance to the word. You know, prosperous, efficient, giving, courageous, loyal, strong, straightforward, powerful, virtuous. Kail, God-fearing. I just love this word. You know, kind, wise, industrious, not lazy, brave, hardworking, patient, artsy, creativity, trustworthy, noble, competent. God says, brand, why did I say power and great glory? I want to distinguish between the Shekinah glory, which is the rabbis that use that word, my church. I am powerful and great. My glory is powerful and great. I am now the resurrection of the life. I am now the Lamb of God. I am Jesus, the beginning and the end, and the one who is and was and is to come. I am in heaven with my new names. And I am all of that. And the glory I have put in you, ignited tonight. Hope and glory is powerful. You're wise. You're not a flaky woman. You are efficient. You're not lazy. You are tactical. You can and think you are brilliant you are honorable you are noble yes you fear God you're a mighty worshiper yes but you're not flaky you even speak in tongues and you have wisdom and power and brilliant you are Kail. so when we fight our battles now we fight it with the Shekinah glory the rabbi branded it that meaning God is with us. They needed to know that God was going to be with them in that journey across the Red Sea. And they said, look, he's the cloud by day. He's a fire by night. Shekinah glory. God, the word Shekinah is not in the Bible. The word Kail is in the Bible. But it was a good branding because it reminds you God with us. And so as God is with us, now God is in us. 
Because the church needs to know how powerful we are, how wise we are, how noble we are. We're not stupid. We're not flaky. We're not flaky tongue talkers. We talk in tongues. We are powerful. We're wise. We're noble. We're honorable. We're efficient. We're critical. We're creative. We are Kyle. Let's look at Colossians 1, 26 and 27, please. Can, it, it, it says the mystery that has been hidden from ages, from generations, is now being revealed to the saints, to God's beautiful church. He says to them in verse 27, Colossians 1, God has made will to make known what are the riches of his glory, of this mystery. The, the riches use the word riches Paul it, it's what is this riches Christ in you Lord of mercy the resurrection and the life in you the lion of Judah in you the lamb of God in you the healer the deliverer the way maker in you is the hope and glory for Sweden the hope and glory for the nations it's the hope and glory for the children it's the hope and glory for a world it's the hope and glory for everyone people of God and Queen Esther and Mordecai prayed and fasted and she went before the king and she said Kail, glory, strategy. I'm not going to bring the king in front of me and just beg him. I'm not going to just tell him I'm a Jew. I'm going to court the king. I'm going to exalt the king like his other wife that, you know, embarrassed him. I'm not going to fight my battle like a Vashti. I'm not going to lower my dignity. I'm going to dress up beautifully. And I'm going to present to the king, Esther, what do you want? Your majesty, I would like to honor you. I would like to build a banquet for you are my king and I honor you. Esther, tell me what you want up to half of the kingdom. What I want is to please you, O king. Will you allow me to do another banquet for you, sir? And he says, go. And Esther came back the next night and dressed up again in beautiful. In other words, she's Kail. She cares about the way she looks. You understand what I'm saying? You're tongue talkers and you're not looking after your body. The whole package is important. The whole package is important, people of God. And so she made sure because what? Mankind look at the outside, God look at the inside. Well, don't judge me by what I look. I don't know your inside. My name is not X-ray. <laughs> I have to judge you by what I see. And so you're going before the king. Going before the king. And so she came again, beautiful. And she curtsied and she bowed. And your majesty, Esther, what do you want? Half of the kingdom. Is that enough? That... Can you imagine half of the value of a nation? She became a, a billionaire immediately. One day you're an orphan, orphan. In another day you're going through trouble. And by the third day, you have a billion dollars offered to you. Lift up your hands. Get ready. Get ready, people. The fierce urgency of now. Why does God need that in the church? Because he has to fight the fight of faith. And it also takes money. God is very practical. And so, what do you want? If you'd please the king, uh, there, there is an edict that has been gone by Haman, and, and he has written that all the Jews must be killed. Yes, I know that, I know that. Your majesty, I'm a Jew. Oh, my God. Rabba kashaka baka, abe kashata. 
I've been sleeping with a Jew all this while. The man was able to speak in tongues just like that. I mean, hello, shock, shock, shock. And Esther is there trembling. Who did this? And Haman heard and ran out. And then the king says, okay. Oh, Esther said, oh, uh, there's a man I want to tell you about, remind you. You remember some of your people in here was going to kill you? And you remember a man came and let you know that there's someone among you could kill you? Yes, yes, yes. His name is Mordecai. He is my uncle. And since you're going to make a shift, I, uh, I want you to appoint him as the chief of staff. And the king says, yes. Well, I want you to deal with Haman. Bring Haman to me. What, what do you, well, well, Haman made a gallows for Mordecai. Let the gallows that he made for Mordecai. Let him hang himself with it. Oh, people of God, are you hearing what I'm saying is going to happen to you? I want you to put it into your life because that is just what God can do. That is just what God can do. <laughs> I mean, what we want him to do for us is not even a, a, mid, a middle of that. I mean, this is what God can do in one day. Mordecai, bring him in. You're anointed. You're appointed. You will be the chief of staff. And and, and what else can we do? Because the edict has already gone through. Oh, the edict, yes, yes, the edict has gone through. Mordecai, Esther, rewrite the edict in your favor. Put whatever you want on that paper. I won't even have to read it. In your favor to protect the Jews, and I will give you my signet ring. They became savior of the Jews. Kyle glory. It's the powerful, great glory. That's how Jesus branded. That God bestowed upon people from Moses and Abraham and all these people, weird people and disciples. And they changed, they were transformed. Paul was different. Kyle glory is the powerful glory of Jesus Christ now in the church. But he was then and is now and is to come. You are now the Moses, the Abram, the Sarah, the Saul. Whatever it is, God says, now, the fierce urgency of now, you are the answer to Sweden. Let's stand before the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.